Hi, it's Alan Edelman and Philip the Corgi, and I'd like to talk to you about stencils. What do you think of when you think of stencils? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is this little pattern thing that I had in grade school, which I used to trace out letters. And if you think about what you could do with it, well, you could kind of see through the window, kind of a little bit. You can see through the window. Let's put the A over Philip. If I can get down there, there's the A on his over his ear. Um, so you've got your window, and of course you could slide it around, right? And of course you could apply patterns, right? So it's window, slide, and apply pattern. Let's do the same thing with the Julia logo, okay? Window, slide, apply pattern. Now it's not always so clear what to do when you hit a boundary. Let's use this little plus sign window. One possibility is just ignore the boundary and slide right off the edge. Another is to stubbornly get stuck at the boundary. Yet another is to put a frame around the boundary and then apply the window. Well, the computational version of all this can be quite a nuisance. We now consider the word stencil as it applies to a numerical situation, which could be an image processing application, a machine learning application, or it could be a differential equation solution. And we remember that uh, we begin with a data matrix and then we apply a stencil. And usually what we're doing is we are windowing numbers in an array. Um, and of course, we're going to be sliding that window. And ultimately what we mean by applying the stencil is that we're going to multiply the numbers in our array by coefficients that come with the stencil, add them all up, and that gives you the new value for the center. So now what I'd like to show you is how you might put boundary conditions in with frames by framing the data, by surrounding your data with a, with a frame. Sometimes it'd be called padding. Sometimes the cells around the boundary are called ghost cells, especially in the context of parallel computing. So let's start out with a six by six array of, uh, there's 36 random numbers from one through nine. And I'd also like to show off some slightly fancy features of Julia, um, including Cartesian indices, which let you index into matrices without using two indices, as well as offset arrays, which let you index, for example, with the zero index. So first here, let me show you, um, here's my data. And uh, here I have these Cartesian indices. And all I have to do is take Cartesian indices of data and you see I've got the 1, 1 in the top left and the 6, 6 in the bottom right. And so if I want to reproduce my data, I can just go data of I for I in capital I. And what that's doing is it's using the single letter as a double index. Okay, so pretty fancy, right? Kind of nice to be able to do that. The next thing I want to show you is offset arrays. So uh, here I'm creating what looks like an 8 by 8 array of zeros. But what's particularly interesting about, about this offset array is that I can index it with a zero index. So here, in fact, let me just show you. Um, if it was a standard array, A of zero, zero would be an error in Julia. It would I guess it'd be OK in C or Python or something. But it would be an error in Julia. But because this is an offset array, I can index A of zero, zero. Or for that matter, I could index um, the zeroth column, A of five, zero, and it doesn't get mad at me, it's just fine. Okay, so that's what an offset array does, and so if you really like zero indexing, you can use it a lot, but you should be careful because if you want to interact with other Julia users, it could lead to some trouble. But now that you see how that works, the I indices are just the indices from one through six, and so if I were to uh, copy my data into this offset array by running through the indices from one through six, you'll see I will have created one of these uh, padded, one of these pad, here I could put a little line around this or something. So you could see that I have my original array and I've got some padding. Okay, so let me go ahead and create another set of Cartesian indices. Let me go ahead and create a neighborhood and a neighborhood is meant to capture the notion of uh, a little three by three box where in the x direction or 
I can go left and right, and in the y direction, I can go left and right one step. So these are Cartesian indices. So this is a three by three collection of Cartesian indices. And now you can see what I could do with this. In fact, let me bring back my array so you can see it. Okay, what we can do is create a six by six array of three by three arrays. So for example, this top left three by, it's kind of written in a compact format, corresponds exactly to this three by three array here or uh, this next one down here, if I could put like a red box around it, corresponds exactly to this three by three. So you have these overlapping arrays um, and you get them all just by using this very neat little syntax in Julia. Okay, and so if I go ahead now and create a stencil, um, here's a stencil, a typical kind of stencil that I might wanna use, then you see, then I could actually go ahead and um, apply the stencil with a code like this, right? And so this would be kind of a step of Jacobi with zero boundary conditions, right? You just go this sort of sum, right? Or we could implement it in this way um, with a for loop. Here, I'm just gonna take a copy of A. This is going to, to have my zero padding. And for every index, what I'm going to do is take my three by three neighborhood, multiply it by a stencil and add them up, okay? Now, we could do some other things. For example, uh, instead of just doing zero padding, right? For example, we could do here, let me go down here and remove these, uh, these comment signs. And you'll notice that now the first, we, we have this, I just made a copy of the, you know, instead of having zero padding, could see what I've done, I've just made a copy just like this, right? The, the, the boundary row is the row, is, is the, you can see the, the, the padded row is the boundary, is the row just before the boundary. So this is what, what people would call zero derivative boundary conditions because obviously if you start taking a derivative, say like this, you would get a zero, right? It's sort of the discrete version of a zero change in that direction, right? Or here's a vertical zero derivative. So this is called a zero derivative condition. And similarly, if I make a slightly different choice, so what I'm gonna do is comment these back. There are actually, you can imagine I have all kinds of cool ways to sort of uh, implement this sort of thing. But here uh, we have what are called periodic boundary conditions. So here, this is going to correspond to the to the bottom of our original data, you see, right? Or uh, to make another choice, this over here is going to correspond to the rightmost of our original choice, you see, and so forth. And so these are periodic conditions that correspond to when you move to the left, it's as if you've sort of wrapped around and ended up at the uh, on the other side, right? And of course, this being Pluto, every time I made one of these choices, it actually implemented, you know, whatever it is I wanted in my Jacobi step. So there are a lot of other things that, that there are a lot of other choices of boundary conditions, but I just wanted to show one way that people can implement, you know, one way you can implement periodic boundary, zero derivative, or just plain zero boundary conditions, um, just by using these padded cells or, or ghost cells. And you can imagine this comes in very handy in parallel computing because if you have a huge array and you have sort of little subarrays on different processors, then if you put ghost cells around the local data on each processor, you know, you can start by padding with zeros, but what you're really going to want to do then is copy the value that would just be over on a neighboring processor, you'd put it there, and then you can sort of compute away. And this is a very common thing that people Thank you.